I do have to agree with my colleague and, and friend, Mr. Van Gils, when we thank you uh, on behalf of the prosecution team for your service, uh, because it's really quite profound, and our system could not operate and work fairly if it wasn't for folks like you that came in from the community, away from the job, away from your family, other responsibilities, and come here and spend your time and and actually participate in something that's really kind of difficult. Um, it's difficult because your cause, you're required to uh, make judgments about other people, uh, you're given the innocence of other people. And that can be a hard task sometimes. And sometimes the testimony can be a little confusing and take a lot of time and be kind of boring. In this case, it's not going to be boring. In this case, you're going to hear the version of the facts that don't simply include two people, as the prosecutor indicated to you. The prosecutor talked to you about a gentleman by the name of Lamont Brown. I will tell you that in two or three weeks I'll be standing right here at this podium and I will give you 11 reasons why you can't believe a single word that comes out of the man's mouth. I'll give you a preview of it now. Prosecutor spent some time telling you there were 13 shells, shell casings found in the street. There were two shooters. He told me that. That's not what Lamont Brown said. He said there were three. Three shooters. Now, prosecutor urged you to look for consistencies, to therefore support credibility. When you listen to Lamont Brown, the clearest inconsistency that he has which can be proved forensically, there were two shooters, not three, but he said three, and he named the other person. That night in Sunbury Village, it was a very active night. You'll hear the testimony that there are 20 or 30 people in the street, hanging out, visiting with each, with each, with each other, and that sort of thing. I will tell you this, the police investigation revealed that at least seven people claimed or were claimed to have participated in the shooting, not just Mr. Lewis. There were others named by other witnesses that the prosecutor has not discussed with you this morning. Mr. Van Gillis uh, didn't tell you quite everything, and it's not my job to tell you, but I'm going to take the time to tell you anyway. There are a number of people on that street that saw exactly what happened and do not name Doug Lewis as a participant in that shooting. Just because the state says it doesn't mean it's so. Now there's been some discussion about gunshot residue, and I just want to take a minute and divert to that for a second. I don't know if any of you know what gunshot residue really is, but if I can just take a moment of your time to kind of give you an overview of it. When you look at a bullet, the bullet has two parts, the projectile and the casing. And the bullet, before it's fired, there's gunpowder inside the casing. When the hammer hits the back of the bullet, the, the gas, the, the explosion that takes place, propels the uh, projectile out the front of the gun. Gunshot residue is an accumulation of different elements. They're found in the same kind of concentration that a scientist can say, this is gunshot residue. And the way they say it is there are three elements. Now think about your high school uh, chemistry days. The periodic chart. There are three elements. Lead, barium, and antimony. Those three elements are found in gunshot residue. Those three elements exist in our environment without being related to gunshot residue. You can get lead on your hand, you can get barium on your hand, you can get antimony on your hand. There are certain jobs that people do, and the expert's going to tell you this, if she testifies truthfully, I'm sure she will. There are certain job functions that you have. For instance, if you're a car mechanic and you work on brakes, there's a real high probability that you're going to have those three elements somewhere on your clothing, on your hands, around your work area. These three elements exist independently in our environment. There's nothing magical about it. 
and to talk about gunshot residue as if it's some sort of fairy dust that's sprinkled on somebody that fires a gun is nonsense. What happened on that night was a terrible thing. What happened on that night never should have happened. Mr. Van Gilles spent almost an hour telling you why it's Doug Lewis, but one thing he neglected to tell you is why. Why would Doug Lewis do this? But what did he say? What did he tell you? He didn't say anything, did he? He didn't say one word about a motive. Why would Doug Lewis run up the street with a gun and shoot this young man in the car? There's no doubt whoever shot him wanted to kill him because Mr. Van Gilles explained to you the shots were close range and they were shot through a, a window that was open. There was no doubt whoever shot him that night wanted to kill him. No doubt. Why? There is no why as it relates to Mr. Lewis. Mr. Van Gilles spent time talking to you about a gun that was found in a, in, a, in a shed in a plastic bag. And I was watching all of you all kind of perked up like, aha, this has got to be something related to this case. Maybe it's one of the guns. Then Mr. Van Gilles said, well, no, that, that gun does, is not related to this case at all. Why are we talking about it? Why don't we hear about the other witnesses on the street that point out other people as the shooters? You're going to hear from Mr. Saruti, and believe me, it's going to be a very interesting experience for you. He's the man in the front seat of the car. He has given multiple statements at various times, even as recently as two weeks ago, as to what he saw, what he experienced. Mr. Brown is very interesting also. We'll talk about him in detail at the end of this trial. Everybody that comes in here, one way or another, has got a background that you'll be instructed legally, you can take into consideration as to whether you're going to believe them or not. What happened to that young man never should have happened. But Doug Lewis had no part of it, was not involved in it, had nothing to do with it. And the proof that Mr. Van Gels is going to point to you, prove that he did it, is based on information from people that you cannot believe. Information from people that have a distorted view of what happened. And he's not going to give you the information from the other witnesses that were present. I'm going to bring them in and I'm going to ask them those questions. You have to have a full picture because your job as jurors is hard. Our job as lawyers is to give you the information necessary to help you reach the proper decision. Witnesses win trials, lawyers don't. Lawyers can lose trials, but they don't win trials, witnesses win. And there's a lot more witnesses that saw what happened that night than Mr. Van Gill shared with you. We thank you for your kind attention, and I do too. But I recognize, and we all recognize, that this is a hard job. But I'm assuring you it's not going to be a boring job.